I, I was first introduced to the concept of a supervised injection facility in a conversation with some experts in the drug policy field in a conversation that took place in the context of my work as the co-chair uh, of the Ithaca plan. And in that conversation, it was suggested to me that as part of our work on the Municipal Drug Policy Committee, we should consider establishing a supervised injection facility in Ithaca. And I was totally ignorant and I said, well, just make sure I know a supervised injection facility is a place where people go and shoot up drugs under the supervision of some kind of medical personnel to make sure they don't overdose and to give them a place to dispose of sharps and clean needles. Do we have that right? And they, they said, yeah. And I said, you are out of your goddamn minds. This is not a city problem. I left Harlem to come here and get clean. And I thought, my friend said, Phoebe, it's beautiful here, come here. I had been in a 28 month treatment program. I came out, started using again. Um, thought like, wow, I just, so I traveled all the way up here to a place that I didn't even know. I never even knew Ithaca, where Ithaca was or what it was, but I was ready to get clean, so I came here and what I found here in Ithaca is exactly what I found what I left in Harlem. I started using again right here. You know, there were drugs here. You know, being an addict, certainly I know, can really beat you down because I mean, it's hard to have high self-esteem when everybody, you know, is, doesn't want you around and they're telling you, you know, that you, you're a piece of crap and, you know, because really, you know, it's, you almost sometimes feel like you're being rejected from society completely or that's how people wish, people wish, would wish that might happen to you. One of the most common misconceptions is that people who use drugs don't care about themselves or others. It's just they care about each other in different ways than other people might. They also say, you know, they can be angry, they can be belligerent, they can be violent, they can be, you know, any, any number of things. I feel like that's probably the biggest barrier to successful treatment of addiction, this fear. And so we're not able to see them as a patient, we're not able to be willing to help them because we're just scared. How to deal with addiction in this community, in our community, is not a business transaction. We're talking about saving the lives of other human beings. As a person who just bought their house in Ithaca today, I would like to believe that I could live in a community that can recognize the humanity of everyone there. DeWitt Park. Um, DeWitt Park is a place um, right in the heart of downtown Ithaca where for as long back as I can remember or know of, people have come to congregate, sit on benches, enjoy the farmer's market, you know, that happens uh, through the spring and summer and fall. Um, and also this is a place where IV drug users have also traditionally come to, um, to inject, inject heroin or whatever drug they want to inject. This spot used to be actually more overgrown and you know we're kind of like weed bushes uh, people could duck in here and not be seen and hide so so that they wouldn't be you know no one would see them or the police wouldn't see them or the police wouldn't be called when they were shooting up um there's a the monument that's right back there is another place where people go and kind of dip into and and try to do what they have to do and shoot up right there you know you know, it takes some people, it takes them a long while to inject because they, their veins are, are, are shot after years of injecting and instead they have to rush all this, you know. Um, to rush stuff like that and be in an unsanitary 
uh, space to begin with, you know, who knows what bacteria and germs are in bathrooms or even on the ground here, who spit here, who's done what? I mean, no one is perfect. I mean, you know, uh, and, but everybody deserves to be treated with some respect and dignity. Well, I think what's happening in Ithaca is the same thing that's happening everywhere. Um, Ithaca is doing a better job of seeing it. Um, I don't live in Ithaca, I live 50 miles away, and I see the same things there, but nobody else does. We have a lot of people that were addicted to um, oral pain medications, so oxycodone, oxycontin, things of that nature, prescription opioids. Um, New York State with the PMP um, really cut down on people's ability and the accessibility, people's ability to obtain these medications and the accessibility of the drug. The cost on the street went way up, and so a lot of people were forced to switch to heroin. But heroin is often contaminated with other things like fentanyl and who knows what else. And that is why we've seen this rise in heroin use because you can't get the oxycodone anymore and the rise in overdose and deaths because you don't know what's in the heroin. Right now in our community, we've lost a lot of young white people to this disease, right? I'm praying that that's not the only reason they think it's so important but it makes people stand up and say we got to do something when their precious white kids are, are being lost right and i'd like that same feeling for our precious black children and people and people of color people here are loving and caring and so i found a lot of people who loved me until i could love myself So I'm Lillian, I'm the Assistant Director of Prevention Services Harm Reduction. I oversee our syringe exchange program and our other programming for uh, people who are actively using substances. We've been doing this a little over eight years um, and we do a lot of different things. Our syringe exchange not only gives out the syringes and takes back in what we uh, have given out, we also give out other supplies that help people stay safe and um, as much as possible prevent uh, HIV and Hep C. Um, and we also pick up sharps that are found in the community. So if a community member calls us and lets us know, here's a spot, we'll come and check it out. And so one of our uh, newest finds that had a lot of syringes in it is back this way. Um, and right now we're just about a block off the common, so right off the main walkways. Um, and tucked in back here is a popular spot. So a few weeks ago, uh, someone in the community let us know that this was um, just covered with injection related materials and we came down to do a cleanup. Uh, you can see some of the stuff has come back. And so when we came and did the cleanup afterwards, we left a sharps container out. People did use some of that, um, but unfortunately, as you can see around, um, other things have come back. <laughs> and this area goes all the way back here. So you can see like caps there. And there are uh, some camps set up as well. You know, the fact that people go to a syringe exchange and get supplies to not only use for themselves, but just to have around so their friends are safe as well, you know, that shows a lot about how much they care about their community as a whole. The Southern Tier AIDS program I was with them from the beginning, and I, uh, I started accessing a lot of their services from the needle exchange to uh, the help they were offering, which I needed at the time. I was very uh, sick and tired of being sick and tired. And they were one-on-one, -on -one and they helped you from start to finish. And that meant a lot to me. Uh, that they gained my trust, whereas other agencies, not so much. Our big joke now is that we take care of patients that nobody else wants to take care of, which is not really that funny, but we really own it. We're really proud of that. I actually always knew I was going to be a pharmacist. My father 
is a pharmacist. He owned a community pharmacy and he was so kind to people and I really loved how he seemed to really make a difference in their lives and I had so much respect for my dad and I thought, gosh, I wish that I could one day change somebody's life for the better or just make one recommendation that's going to make their day better. Like, it's a really powerful thing. I wanted to become a doctor because I actually wanted to help people. There's a paternalistic quality to being in medicine, which is I'm here taking care of you. And therefore, you should be listening to what I say because I'm a doctor and you're not a doctor. You shouldn't be using drugs. You're not allowed to be using drugs. I say you can't be using drugs. And so it sets up this whole sort of lying dynamics. They right away come in fearful of the staff and sort of, um, I would say having sort of bad behavior towards the staff. I sort of get on board with them right away. But I think a lot of the people who are users face a lot of bad attitudes and it makes them fearful in that environment. You know, a few very trusting souls opened up to me and, and I, I realized, wow, there's a story behind this. This is not just a person coming in for drug X, for disease state Z. There's a reason for this. For me, like many addicts, a traumatic event set us off. Whether it be emotional or physical, they're both valid. And uh, I think that there are many people that self-medicate. I think if Ithaca had an injection facility on a, on a methadone clinic years ago, the number one thing that would be impacted would be the, the number of obituaries we wouldn't have. I fully, fully support supervised injection facilities, but I didn't al always. And I think a lot of people's reluctance, you know, with from handing out condoms to handing out clean needles and syringe exchanges to, you know, having naloxone standing orders, I think it's fear and the unknown. And people really struggle with the unknown and, and where is this going to go. If they come out and use in one of these facilities, we could then build relationships and hopefully get them in a place where they realize somebody cares about them, somebody's fighting for them, somebody wants their, them to be well, and then hopefully get them onto wellness. When I was very young, we were very poor. I actually lived for the first six months of my life in a homeless shelter. And you know, when you're poor, more than, more than just about anybody else, you, you become aware of government's role in your life. You know, when you have food stamps or uh, subsidized lunch, and you take the school bus, and you, you know, you go to, to after school because your mom works late and can't pick you up. Uh, I mean, you you just start to think about systems at a young age, and you know, the reason we grew up poor is because my father was a, uh, a drug user and an addict. He's been an addict for, gosh, almost 30 years now, and what that means is that. I got to witness the other side of the system, the system that currently says, well, if somebody's using drugs, arrest them, um, and that will somehow make it better. I saw that it did not work for him. I mean, it did not work for my family. But I thought, for my whole childhood, I thought, well, I guess that's just a problem for people who use drugs. The Ithaca Plan is a public health and safety approach to drug policy. It's a set of policies, 25 in total, that if we follow them, will reduce drug use, uh, reduce drug dependence, reduce deaths from drug use, and increase health and well-being for current drug users and people in recovery. And for a lot of people, that's going to mean sobriety, but it's not going to mean sobriety for everybody. The public safety issue that arises is whether or not addiction is actually a criminal justice issue or is it a public health issue? And the experience of my office, my experience as a prosecutor here in Ithaca, is that addiction should be handled as a public health issue. If prosecutors take the position that the 
community impact of addiction can be dealt with from the standpoint of treating addiction, treating AIDS, treating uh, all the hepatitises, making uh, syringe disposal safer, making the experience of addiction safer, all of us are going to be safer. Not only does our current system fail drug users, it fails police officers, it fails the judges, it fails the lawyers, it fails the jails themselves, which are overflowing, it fails the taxpayers because for all of this arresting and jailing we've been doing, it has not reduced drug use, it has not reduced overdoses, it has not reduced public consumption, it has not reduced public needle disposal, it just has not done anything good. So I wanted to do something good. in Vancouver, in Europe. I started reading about uh, other countries' approach to addiction and to uh, the regulation of substances, and I learned as much as I could. And I came to the realization, after a re relatively short period of time, that a supervised injection facility is, one, safer, we, not as many people will die. In Vancouver, over the whole, all the years of the existence of that SIF, not a single person has died of an overdose. Now here in Ithaca, last Mother's Day, three people died, Mother's Day weekend. So there is a screaming need to make people safer from overdose. And a supervised injection facility will provide that safety. You know, when we proposed the Ithaca plan, and the media focused very much on supervised injection. Um, a lot of people said, look, this is becoming the most controversial part of the plan. You could just drop this. The other 24 recommendations will go a long way to making people healthier, making them live longer. It did sound radical when I first heard about it. And that comes out of a tradition in our country of thinking about uh, addiction as something that we need to wage war on. We've tried that for almost 50 years, and it hasn't worked. But the reason that supervised injection facilities are controversial is because the message they send is that drug users deserve to live. So the pushback we were receiving from people who did not believe that drug users had a right to life that is not something I could let slide. A safe injection facility in Ithaca would dramatically change the emergency department. I think we would have a huge drop in infections a huge drop in um, overdoses being brought to the emergency department and I think we would have more people getting into recovery. It's very emotional for me to consider how many people have died that I know or come close to it. If there was a supervisory injection center in Harlem 40 years ago, it might have looked like people cared about that community. SIFs are necessary everywhere. Um, we have the kind of community where a lot of people are either homeless or marginally housed. They don't have safe places to go. It's a place where people can dispose of all these used syringes, you know, that would have been left around here. We've had people die in bathrooms. We've had people die in the street. Um, and it's, it's not necessary. It doesn't have to happen that way. Ithaca needs and deserves a SIF because we have been very forward-thinking and very accepting up to this point. This is the next step to support our community as a whole. Because really, 
don't we want to stop burying our loved ones? People who stay silent now or, or oppose supervised injection will be looked back in the long lens of history. They will be looked at like the people who fought against sexual education in schools or fought against syringe exchanges in the 80s and 90s. They will be viewed harshly and that the time to be right on this issue is now. Economically, socially, health-wise, it's a no-lose proposition. People call it a can of worms, but I think it's going to hopefully turn out to be butterflies.